Welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. I'm Chad, and to my left is a very special co-host and resident expert on animal shelters and pets. She's the Director of Shelter Outreach and Engagement at the Humane Society of the United States, Lindsay Hamrick, my co-host. Hooray! Hooray! What a nice surprise to be co-hosting with you today. I, it's a real honor for me, so welcome aboard. Um, so, Lindsay, we you'll remember, I think you were on the episode... Um, Back in January, we reported on a crisis with pet adoptions from animal shelters. Um, and today we we have an update like on those stats that we, we talked about before. We've got a new report from Hills Pet Nutrition. Um, and aside from my co-host, Lindsay, we've got two expert guests to weigh in on this topic. Um, Dr. Karen Chenoy is the United States Chief Veterinary Officer for Hills Pet Nutrition. And Amanda Foster from Human Animal Support Services. Welcome, you guys. Thanks so much for having us. Absolutely. Uh, so, Lindsay, let me start with you just because you were with us before. The um, What's changed? What's changed since we did that last report on some animal shelter stats? Yeah, so if folks remember, in January, we talked about how there has been this backlog of cats and dogs waiting for adoption and other kinds of outcomes like being returned to their original families that is creating this feeling of overcrowding or literal overcrowding in shelters and rescues. And while that is unfortunately still the case, what the reason we brought in some new experts on this conversation is there's been some new data and new surveys done to help us drill down on what might be leading to some of that backlog so that we can end on a hopeful note about what we can do to move more animals out into adoptive homes and clear out this backlog of pets waiting. Well, I'll start with you, Dr. Shinoy. Um, so Hills Pet Nutrition really did some exhaustive research into animal shelters and potential adopters with this new report you've got. Um, so what's your goal with this whole report? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Our goal really was uh, understanding some of what Lindsay just talked about, that over the last four years, shelters across the country are at or above capacity in terms of the animals that are in their care. And in recognizing that, we wanted to really understand some of the factors happening outside of shelters. We know that adoptions are, or excuse me, intake rates are coming down just a little bit, but we're also seeing adoption rates decline. And so there's more animals coming into the shelters than are leaving. And there's good data about what's happening in the shelters, but more that we can do to understand some of the dynamics outside of shelters and maybe what we can do to help accelerate adoption rates. So the whole goal is slow intake and increase pet adoptions. Yes. Clearly, I'm not the expert on this, you guys. You're going to have to help me along. Well, and I was going to say that what I think is optimistic here is that, to me, increasing adoptions is pretty straightforward, right? It's not that it doesn't take effort. It doesn't mean that we don't have to reduce really uh, significant barriers to adoption for people. But in my opinion, that happens faster than addressing some of the root causes of why animals end up in shelters in the first place, which we will all collectively, of course, keep working on. But in the short term, getting more animals into adoptive homes is going to be our, our key. Uh, Amanda, anything to jump in on? I, I, I don't want to leave you out here. Human uh, Animal Support Services obviously has a lot to do with this uh, shelter stat stuff as well. Um, so Human Animal Support Services is really focused on that connection between keeping pets with their people. And a lot of our work is centered around what Lindsay was talking about with reducing unnecessary intake. Uh, but this project that I'm talking about today was all about increasing adoptions and understanding more about why people are coming to shelters, but not leaving with animals. So what did we find? What's the biggest concern people have about adopting a pet? And what are some of the ways we can we can mitigate those those concerns? I'll uh, maybe start and I'm sure others have things to add that uh, the survey that we did looked at 2,500 respondents across the country from socioeconomically diverse backgrounds. And first of all, a bit of good news is that we found about two thirds of respondents are likely to adopt a shelter pet at some point in time. So certainly hope, I think we need to think about reducing some of the barriers that the report uncovered and help uh, people maybe make those decisions to adopt sooner rather than later and, and can do some things to help influence. But overall, people are open to pet adoption. Specific barriers, I guess one thing that I'll bring up uh, for us to talk through are some of the cost challenges. No surprise there that cost is a barrier to adoption. 
What I found interesting is that we uncovered that the kind of threshold where people were reporting that cost was a real barrier for them to adoption was about $75,000 in terms of household income, which is quite a high number when you think about it. But even those making $75,000 are finding that it's challenging to adopt a pet. And uh, we also understood that those making less than $50,000 experienced challenges like housing restrictions and you know, cost of veterinary care and other uh, influences that are related to cost, but additional barriers. Yeah, one thing that I would say is for the Humane Society of the United States and many others, we don't want adoption to be a privilege. We don't want it to be exclusive to people who are living at certain socioeconomic levels or people who own their homes and don't need to deal with uh, as many housing restrictions. And so we really want adoption to be accessible to everyone, but we collectively need to address some of these cost concerns around, in particular, access to veterinary care um, and just pet supplies in general. And I think one of the things that I found so promising in the recent years is that so many local shelters and rescues are offering either low-cost services or free pet food pantries, um, supplies that help uh, either original pet owners or new pet owners be able to keep the pets that they're interested in. And I think the more we address this cost issue, the more uh, everybody will be welcome to come in and adopt a pet. It seems like, so in looking through some of the data on your report, there's a lot of stuff in there. It seems like just to parse into it a little bit, it seems like things are getting better uh, slightly maybe for shelter cats, but then large dogs on the other, large adoptable dogs continue to wait longer for adoption. Can we talk about that? Why do we think that is? Yeah, absolutely. You're head on that the uh, adoptions have slowed for both cats and dogs, but it's more so for dogs. And within the dog population, large dogs are impacted uh, the most. And in our survey, we found so wait, why so why large dogs? What's the difference? I don't understand. Like a, a small dog, big dog. What's the why would some I, one take longer some to of get this adopted? Is um is sort of my own opinion as we look at some of the sure. data and try to piece it together. I think some of the housing restrictions and costs that we were just talking about are more prominent with the larger breed dogs. Okay, think about it, housing restrictions uh, definitely can be challenging when you've got. A, a bigger pet, they're not necessarily as welcome in apartment settings and cost to feed and provide care and things is is more so with the larger dogs. So I think that's uh, tied into what we're seeing. Gotcha. You okay. also can't hide them. I mean, so many of us have hidden cats in our rental units. Um, it's a little harder to hide a 90 pound dog from your landlord. <laughs> so you've done questionable things before, Lindsay. As we've discussed many times, yes. <laughs> Uh, as a renter myself and somebody who just moved, um, it's very difficult to find a place that will take one large dog, uh, wow. little, many or oh, multiple, man. not many. Yeah. And one thing on the housing piece that we're learning through some separate data at HSUS is I think of a large dog as like 70 pounds or more. But some of these housing restrictions, they consider a, a medium or large sized dog to be any any dog over 25 pounds. And oh, so my we're, gosh. That's we're really... talking about like <laughs> like everyone can have a chihuahua or a cat, but they can't have like most medium sized dogs. So the shelter animals count data of which we refer to often in these conversations, it's also showing that medium sized dogs are waiting longer for homes um, in addition to what we all would consider to be larger dogs. The other thing I would add in is uh, from the survey, you know, we were kind of asking the potential adopters a bit about their propensity to adopt different sized dogs and fewer than one in four people in general are kind of open to or planning to adopt a large dog. So I talked about two thirds of people having an interest in adopting from a shelter at some point, but those larger dogs generally are kind of less top of mind for people. The uh, positive thing that did come through though is that younger generations, Gen Z, Millennials, uh, they were actually more interested in adopting larger dogs than the older populations, which did surprise me. So I think there's hope as those individuals maybe get into bigger houses and get kind of farther along in their adulthood. And we may see them quite interested in larger dogs. <laughs> uh, well, switching it up a little bit, Amanda, your work, uh, I think some of your work about adoptions, pet adoptions in shelters happens your work happened inside the shelters. Is that right? Can is that? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, that's correct. So we looked at five different shelters across the United States, different regions, sizes, um, different types of admission, um, nonprofit versus municipal. And we 
we were trying to answer the question of why are people not adopting if we're seeing a lot of people show up physically to the shelter? And what was really interesting was at the beginning of this project, we did also a little bit of a dive into like what the competition, so to speak, might be for people that are in this day and age looking online to buy a dog. Um, and the difference between that experience for a potential adopter where they can go on their phone, uh, pick out a puppy and have it delivered to them basically the next day with all of the supplies that, that they need compared to taking the time to go to an animal shelter and what that experience looks like um, for that potential adopter was a, a stark difference, which was really interesting to look at. So um, we wanted to know, there's always this big focus on how do we get more people to come to shelters to adopt? And we wanted to take kind of a zoomed in look at what that experience is like and where those barriers are within our system once people show up. Right. If somebody's walking into a shelter, we want them to walk out with a pet, right? Right. Yes. And so that's exactly right. We want every person who comes in interested to in looking at adoptable pets to leave with a pet that day, whether it's an adoption or a foster. And what we were finding is that on average, one in three people who wanted to take a pet home were actually taking a pet home uh, over the data collection period. And this was a big range from as low as 8% to as high as 51%. So uh, a lot of differences across the organizations. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Why that variance? Why do we, one shelter's doing it one way, another's doing another way? I don't. Yeah. There's a lot of different factors that go into that. Um, these organizations were in different parts of their community. One was right outside of a bus stop, super accessible in a city. Um, most of the other ones were in, you know, the, the back of the community next to maybe like a, a garbage dump or something like that. Uh, not as accessible for anyone yeah. to just go to, but also um, different hours and uh, different processes, a lot of um, different things that people would have to do when they came in in order to adopt. And we know that staffing is also a big factor in that. Um, organizations that had really long wait times for somebody to actually get to meet a pet were having a hard time getting pets out the door. Yeah, I think about, I think all of us have been to um, very rural organizations. And one of the last uh, shelter tours I did was a community that's trying to place dogs out of a facility that is literally behind a, a chained gate of their water treatment facility for the county. So like set aside adoption hours and staffing, like like no one can even get through the gate literally because it's a water treatment facility. So there's just so many, there's some barriers that I think we can control. And then there's other things that are out of our control. And how do we get more pets out visible to the community so that there can be those adoption outcomes? Yeah, I think it's kind of a cliche. I think it's changing, right? But yeah, they always put the local animal shelter near the cement factory somehow or some bizarre out of the way area, which is doesn't make sense for a lot of people when they want traffic coming in there. Yeah, and there's so many beautiful new shelters over yeah. the last two decades, um, and those are amazing. And also, to Amanda's point, you know, for folks who maybe don't have transportation or they have their working full-time jobs or more than one job, do they have the time? Are there hours available for them to get to a facility? Um, can they do it quickly uh, so that they're not spending half of their day or all of their day just trying to adopt a pet? When, to Amanda's point, the competition out there is they can go online and get a pet with very good customer service and very quickly. Um, and we want to make sure that the experience at shelters and rescues is positive and efficient as well. And to Lindsay's point, um, the things that we can control, the number one reason that we were seeing people weren't leaving with a pet when they wanted to was that the pet itself wasn't ready to leave. So oh. it was it was on hold, um, either waiting some kind of like medical behavior a stray hold, things like that. So people were leaving, wanting to take a pet and couldn't. Um, and that's why things like offering trial adoptions or foster to adopt day trips, things like that are really, really important for shelters to consider. Um, if there's any way that the pet could go, even just as a foster, um, 
we know that there's research out there. Dr. Gunter does some research that shows that dogs that go on day trips, um, just a, a field trip with a potential adopter are five times more likely to be adopted. So the goal is to get them out as soon as uh, somebody says that they're interested. The things I'd love to, to add, I think related to this, there's often a lot of misconceptions about the pets that are available in shelters. And so people might think it's only pit bulls or only large dogs or only certain types of um, breeds. And, and we know that there's a huge variety that shelters right now really are at capacity and they've got kittens and puppies and adult dogs and you know active dogs and calm dogs and purebreds and just a, a lot of different uh, pets that are available. And so when individuals do come if they end up uh, not walking out the door with a pet. I think one important message is to make sure that they know to go back and continue to keep their eyes open because there's such a variety of animals in shelters right now that they're very likely to find the right pet if they just keep looking. And on the other side of that, having shelters also gather that information too, to say, Dr. Shinori came in today and wanted this type of pet that we don't have. Let's get that information so that we can make a phone call tomorrow when that dog comes in and doing right. a little bit more proactive customer customer service. Mm -hmm. Some of those best practices like the day out programs and some of the things you just mentioned are also in the, the report that Hills put out. So that's another kind of plug for the report beyond the data is there's a lot of really nice best practices uh, listed for shelters to think about implementing. Yeah. And I think, you know, Chad, you and I have talked before about my, uh, I don't know if it's a fear of commitment or just uh, um, inconsistency with my ability to make decisions. But I do think that the more that we can be flexible with people and let them get to know an animal before making a decision could have really widespread effects, which that might look like foster to adopt. It may just look like, hey, you're, you just walked in, you're now a new foster parent for us, get to know this pet at home. And if she's not a great fit for you, that's totally fine. You've just saved us a weekend, a week uh, of cage space, and we will work. Now we know more about her and we'll work to find another placement. Um, but I think the more we can elevate a culture of flexibility, the more we're we're helping uh, potential adopters make those decisions. Yeah, the foster thing is interesting. I think, um, I think maybe there's some, this probably came up in some of your research, everybody, but about some confusion amongst the public about what foster means or what do I have to pay for? And what is that? What kind of commitment am I? Is that is that right? Is there some confusion out there, do we think, in the communities about what foster means? Yeah, I think for us, we found that 40% of prospective fosters said that they're afraid of adopting the pet. And I think that's a couple different things in there. You know, some of it is probably them worried that they're going to fall in love with the animal and sure. they're not intending to have a long-term pet. But I also think some of it is a worry that the shelter expects that. And so an important thing for potential fosters to understand is that any amount of support that they can provide, you know, as Lindsay was just saying, if they can take a pet for a, a period of time, that helps alleviate some of the pressures and need for resources and space in the shelter. So any level of support is helpful, even if there's no expectation on either side for the pet to be adopted. Yeah. And I think also clarifying for folks that expenses are covered, whatever that looks like for that shelter or rescue, just being very clear on their website, um, in their marketing materials, that these are exactly the things we will cover. And that might be the all the medical care. It may be X number of bags of pet food that you'll need for a month of foster, um, cat litter, supplies, et cetera. And I know for me, I just keep the supplies because I foster routinely. And so it's not like I need to haul back all this stuff every time I finish fostering. I keep all this, the crates and the litter boxes and the toys and wash them. And then I pick up the food and any consumables the next time that I foster. So it makes it easier. The more you do it, uh, the more stuff you'll have. And uh, I think it gets easier over time. So let me take a step back, everybody. And ask about all your research was what's what's kind of stuck out in your mind what surprised you was there stuff that you were like holy cow I didn't realize that for me we hit on most of the things that I found really interesting or surprising but the uh, one point we've not talked about yet is that 94 percent of respondents indicated that when they got post-adoption support they kept their pet in instances where they were potentially thinking of relinquishing the pet so we started the conversation talking a little bit about the interconnection between getting pets adopted, but then also keeping pets in home and helping to prevent more pets from going into the shelters. There's related strategies there. And it just it was really heartwarming to see that when some level of support was provided, whether they were facing behavioral concerns with the pet or health concerns or just anxiety over whether they were doing the right thing for the pet, 
that as those even simple interventions were put into play, that people, you know, were very likely to keep their pet. And as a veterinarian, I also was happy to see that a lot of that support came from veterinary professionals. So we play an important role in that new pet owner's life. Yeah. So the the relationship with a shelter and adopter doesn't end when they walk out to the parking lot. Right. Maybe they stay in touch and let them know about concerns. Okay. That makes sense. And the more that we can be seen as a pet resource center and as folks who have expertise and tips for people to be successful, the more we can say yes to making matches between families and adopters. And so the Humane Society of the United States, we are relaunching a program called Adopters Welcome, which is all about removing common barriers to adoption. That might be things like shelter staff spending time on checking if your lease is pet friendly or calling your veterinarian to make sure that your existing pets are up to date on vaccinations. Sort of this like checklist that is supposed to prove that someone will be a a good pet owner. And instead we wanna get rid of all the paperwork and we wanna spend that time having conversations. And so when someone comes in and access to veterinary care, for example, is a challenge, if the shelter also has a nonprofit or low cost option for vaccines and uh, wellness care, now you have a solution for someone to be able to adopt a cat or a dog and then return to you for resources. So um, the more we can position that and see everybody who walks through our door or even the folks who we aren't yet reaching as potential adopters, the more obviously the more outcomes uh, for adoption we'll have. There were quite a few things that surprised me about the work that we did. Um, one of them was that non-adopters, uh, if they leave without a pet, that they're really not very likely to come back. We saw that if we missed that first opportunity when somebody came in looking to adopt and they didn't, that they were only coming back about 17% of the time, which really highlights that we need to be making the most of that first visit and giving them a good experience, hopefully having them leave with a pet, but if not getting their information so we can follow up later. Um, So that was a really big takeaway. I wasn't expecting it to be quite that low, um, but I think it makes sense. Uh, We also saw that one thing that shelters were really struggling with was, and maybe this is due to to staff turnover, I'm not sure, but getting the information about adoptable pets to the people who needed it to make those adoptions happen. So making sure that volunteers and animal care staff, the people that are in love with the pets in the back and getting to know them every day actually have an efficient avenue for getting that information about those pets that they love up to the adoption staff that are helping to make that connection with the public. So that was a really, really eye-opening trend that we were seeing was the need for systems like that. Gotcha. Well, let's, as we're wrapping up here, let's sell it people. What, uh, what can we do to get people uh, to help their local shelter, what what do they what do we need? What do we need to do? Um, my pitch is forget everything you thought that you knew about shelter shelters and rescues. Things are changing, have been changing over time, and uh, be courageous and go to your shelter and say, "I'm not ready for a permanent pet, but I would love to take a dog home this weekend. Would you let me do that?" Great, Dr. Karen. Let's hear from yeah. you. So building on that, I would say uh, recognize that there are a wealth of resources out there to help support you in the process from the shelter, from the veterinary clinic side. Um, It's been great to see that there's been an evolution. Uh, Animal shelters are not just sheltering and housing the animals, but doing a lot to reach out into the community. So if you have any inkling that you might be interested in welcoming a shelter pet into your home, know that there's a ton of resources out there to help support you in that. And to build off that, I'd say even if you can't take a pet home, Go find out how you can volunteer either directly with the pets to help learn more about them that could get them home. Or if you're more of a a people forward kind of person, there's always need for customer service type volunteers in shelter lobbies. Fantastic, everybody. Um, Thank you so much, everybody, for for this talking about this important topic today. Um, I appreciate your time. This has been great information. Um, Hopefully let's have everybody get out there and support their local shelter. Um, We will see you next time on Humane Voices. 